Perfect. Got it. Okay. So hey. maybe do. Hi, everybody. Um, <laughs> my name's Teresa Giorza, and I am the author of one of the two uh, chapters that we're talking about. Um, and Roseanne Reynolds, the author of the other one, um, may join us later. I know that initially uh, the plan was for other people to lead the session, but it didn't work out that way. So <laughs> we're going, going with it. Thank you, Teresa, um, for leading. Okay. So it would be nice if we could just each give a short uh, introduction so we know who we are well you know, who we, we in the room with. Um, I'm, I'm based at uh, the University of the Protestant in, in Johannesburg. Um, and I, I work in the Foundation Studies Division, but my research is around um, arts-based methodologies and uh, post-humanist pedagogies, I'd say. Okay, I'll go next. Um, I So my name is George Rowley and I'm the research assistant for the post qualitative Research Collective and also the Decolonizing Early Childhood Discourses project, which are sort of different but interlinked. Um, so I'm just uh, facilitating the technical hosting um, of the webinar. Thanks, George. Um, I'm Anne Swirsky. I'm a, um, an independent scholar, always have been, never been attached to a university, though I graduated both from WITS and from Tel Aviv University. My doctorate is in childhood history, specifically 19th century America. I'm interested in children. I uh, established debating in Israel as a way to give children a voice. And I also established a junior parliament in Israel, which is an active civic education program that so far has taught some 5,000 kids how civics are supposed to work. Unfortunately, I haven't taught the adults, so they don't know. And we're not doing very well at present, but we're doing our best. <laughs> and I'm fascinated by everything that's going on in these two groups and through to been invited. I've never really understood why, but the minute I was, I said, thank you very much. And uh, unfortunately, uh, in the coming weeks, I probably won't be able to join the Monday session, but I'll certainly be reading about it. Wednesday still works for me, but Monday something has come up that will make it impossible for me to participate. Thanks, Anne. I'll continue. My name is uh, Lindon. Yes. And I'm a social worker from Israel. Uh, this is my first time in, in a meeting like this. I, I was just in the ECQI that was in uh, Portsmouth. And that's how I, I'm very interested. I'm a, I'm a qualitative researcher in social work. And I write about uh, transmission, transgenerational transmission of trauma. And I'm interested in post qualitative research. So that's how I heard about the book. And I started Googling uh, post qualitative collectives. And then I'm here now. Uh, so <laughs> I'm okay. interested to see how things will uh, turn out. Thanks. Hi everyone, my name's Anya Martin. I'm a third year PhD uh, student at Rhodes University. Um, and then I have two supervisors, Dylan McGarry, who's based at Rhodes and Vivian Bozilek, who's based at the University of the Western Cape. Um, and my research is uh, focusing on um, kind of rediscovering our connection to the environment and particularly uh, the stories of black and brown bodies um, in our South African context in a post-apartheid legacy. Thanks, Anya. 
Hi, I, I'll pop in next. I'm Marlene uh, and I'm based here in Dublin, Ireland. Um, my area of study really is pedagogical documentation. And I suppose I'm kind of here. I feel like a bit of a great crasher really as a learner because I uh, I sort of through, through my readings, I've come to Karen Barad and I find that a lot of the time I read and I understand the words and I understand the concepts in my head, but actually living it or in employing it or applying it, I, practicing it in my in my studies, I find challenging. And so I felt perhaps coming in here today, I'd, you know, learn from you guys. So that's me. Thanks. Thanks. Welcome. I could go. I'm Ezra. Um, I'm a grad student at Tufts University in the United States in Massachusetts. Um, and I'm in a STEM education program looking at like a post-human framework for uh, STEM education at the moment in a computational physics course. And I'll go. I'm Hilary Jenks. I'm based in Johannesburg in South Africa, currently staying in a slow town on the coast. Mm. Um, doing slow reading and slow everything. Um, my, I'm trying to look at literacy from a post-humanist, new materialist, agential realist perspective um, in trying to understand a young child's literacy becoming. Wonderful. Thanks, everybody. Um, so the, the reading group, well, the reading session today is um, based on two chapters. Um, I see Tandy's just joined us. Um, uh, we can, um, depending on whether people have actually read the chapters or not, we can decide whether we want to just take perhaps Roseanne's uh, chapter and maybe read slowly a section of the chapter and then maybe move on to the other chapter and, and, and read a section. There are, there are um, links between the two. Um, so uh, maybe you can think about that and let, let, let us know what, what you'd prefer. Tandy, do you want Tandi, where do you want to introduce yourself quickly? Hello, my name is Ola Tandi. Very happy to be here. Very excited. I'm yes, from okay. Johannesburg in South Africa. What else do you say? I just ran home from the shop, so I'm a little bit disorganized. I'm so happy to be here and I can't wait. Okay, good. And you're at Vitz at the moment, based at Vitz. Yes, I'm based at Wits in the Marang Center for Medicine and Science Education. And um, actually, I must say this in one sentence. We are trying to open a research wing for early childhood, looking okay. at Baradin stuff and Regio Emilia. So very exciting work. You'll be seeing a lot of this space. Good. Mm -hmm. we'll, keep, we'll, we'll watch out for that. Okay. So, so does somebody want to um, propose a way forward? Um, um, yeah. Should we um, read? Should we? No, yeah. I think I think we should read. I, mm. I haven't had a chance to read either of the papers. Right. I've only read uh, Teal, okay, which is Anne's um, piece, but um, I haven't read the other two. So the two that that have been sent. I, I, you know, I'm used to us reading together. So I'm, yes. what is the format for this for this um, hour? Yes. Do Are we creating that right now? What is the plan for the hour? Yeah, is yes. it? Yes, so we, we're planning it now. Okay. Um, we've got two chapters. So we've got red and we've got red ochre. Um, should I share my screen or how should we do that? Uh, you can you that the the chapters were sent on uh, yes. WhatsApp, so yeah, you can open it. them on your screen. But I can also share. I think um, if you share the screen, that would be great. Thanks, Teresa. Okay. 
And then which one shall we read? Read. Roseanne Reynolds. Okay. So, so um, we we should we should uh, try to to dip into both. The other one is um, Red Ochre, which is my chapter. Um, but I won't. I, I think if I if I yeah you know, switching switching screens. I mean I can, but uh, it's uh, it doesn't automatically. Uh, jump, hey? Eh? No, so, you did. Yeah. yeah, so this is this one, red ochre. Okay. So th this is the second, this is the second one. Okay. Teresa, may I suggest that seeing yes. that you're here and Roseanne isn't, maybe we should read your chapter and you should lead it because it's a rare gift to have the author actually online to help you read. We mm. don't have to imagine what you were thinking. You can tell us. Mm. Okay. Anybody does how how do other people feel about that? Sounds like a good plan. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's don't let's um go get into it because then maybe we'll have more time to actually look a little bit at both. And Roseanne might arrive at some point. Um. So, um, should I don't mind reading, but uh, we can take it in turns. So I'll start, and then someone can take over. Is that okay? Great. Okay. Chapter Red Ochre. Marking time, marking bodies, relations matter. Becoming with flow and flesh. Science and justice, matter and meaning, are not separate elements that intersect now and again. They are inextricably fused together, and no event, no matter how energetic, can tear them asunder. They cannot be dissociated, not by chemical processing, <coughs> or centrifuge, or nuclear blast. That's Karen Barad, 2010. Next door to the preschool research site is a public park that the children visit regularly. In the park, there is a mature tree that has areas of its inner trunk exposed where bark has been removed in two places. The children's imaginings construct these areas of damage as a door where the shape is an arch shape and bums where the exposed area is at five-year-old bottom height. I asked a number of the children about what that space in the bark looked like and they agreed it was the tree's bums. One particularly empathetic explanation was because it's lost its covering. I'm amazed that the children notice the tree's nakedness. What can this exposure mean for a tree? And what does the children's shared awareness, recognition, and naming of the bums say about their own experience of nakedness? The bark works as an essential part of the living tree. And had the entire circle of its bark been removed, it would have died. The removal of this layer allows us to see inside, to see the inside, into the inside of the tree, a more intimate part of itself. This conversation worked, works in interdisciplinary ways and diffracts natural science concepts, skin, phloem, protective layer, with issues of personal well-being, life skills, and keeping my body safe all parts of the foundation phase life skills curriculum in, a South, in South African schools. Does somebody want to read? Yes, I'm happy to go. Thanks. Um, this account is increasingly a story about my own learning about the pedagogies of welding with this space, this time, this matter, the children drew me into their ways of thinking with their surroundings using empathetic and animistic sensibilities. The, the negotiation of shifting boundaries, private and public, inside and outside, human and tree, allow me to follow new thoughts about this tree and, their scar and these scars. Barra's diffraction as method invites us to let thought, 
open out to other ways of thinking, such as thinking together with and as waves. Barad questions the dualism of classical physics, which seeks to differentiate between particles and waves, and which tends to favor the individualized and position fixed identity of particles. Barad follows Bohr's radical reworking of the classical worldview, suggesting that reality and experimental examples from quantum physics shows us that waves and particles exhibit queer behavior, taking on shifting and entangled identities and temporalities of neither, nor, and both, both and, an ontology of indeterminacy. Do you want me to continue? Do you want me to continue, or should we? Yeah. Stop or if somebody. Yeah. Do we? Do. You, uh, uh, yeah. So we we need to decide where, at what point, and it's quite open. Um, at what point we want to stop, if questions emerge, um, comments. Um, should we go on? Should we read a little bit more? I think we're going, just getting into the wave story here. Does somebody okay. else want to read? I'm happy to go. Okay, thank you. Hi, Tandy, are you going? Oh, yes, thank you. A querying ontology. And therefore, not fixed in one location, describes the curving and spreading of waves as they pass through narrow spaces like holes in a breakwater. The multiple spreading patterns of waves overlap one another and combine to create an interference or overlapping where the waves change in themselves. Uh, a difference producing difference in the interaction. I think you create an interference pattern or superposition. Oh, the unexpected me. results in which uh, huh? Sandi, Sandi, I can your your um connection is not great. We keep losing you. Yeah, I didn't I can't hear you and then it's like catches up very quickly. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's not, a, sorry. Not working. It's not, yeah. Oh, she's saying she's low shaded. Someone else will oh, have to yeah. sorry. Can somebody maybe start from yeah, the acquiring ontology. I can pick it up if you like. Thanks, Thanks Anne. Acquiring ontology. A wave is not an object, but rather a disturbance, and therefore not fixed in one location. Using the example of water waves, Barad describes the curving and spreading of waves as they pass through narrow spaces like holes in a breakwater. The multiple spreading patterns of waves overlap one another and combine to create an interference or overlapping where the waves change in themselves, difference producing difference in interaction, and create an interference pattern or superposition. The curving of light waves is shown to have unexpected results in which the shadow of an object shows a pattern of alternating dark and light lines around its edge. Light and dark are not separate and distinctly bounded entities, but through diffraction, carry traces of each other within their formation. Diffraction is not a set pattern, but rather an iterative reconfiguring of patterns of differentiating, entangling, or a cutting together apart one move, that's complicated. <laughs> a superposition or diffraction enacts a being in multiple places at one time and multiple times at one place, multiple identities in and as one being. Barad shows how Derrida's linguistically based 
de deconstruction works materially through the workings of difference. Bohr explains how it is possible for electrons to perform particleness under certain experimental, experimental circumstances and waveness under others. The key is understanding that identity is not essence, fixity, or givenness, but a contingent iterative performativity, thereby reworking this alleged conflict into an understanding of difference, not as an absolute boundary between object and subject, here and there, now and then, this and that, but rather as the effects of enacted cuts in a radical reworking of cause effect. You want me to stop there? Or should I continue? Thanks. I'm I'm thinking, okay, so the next section work uh, moves into the um travel hopping. Um and I'm thinking we could uh we could jump to the other paper, the other chapter and because I know that Roseanne also works with travel hopping. So uh, how do people feel? Uh, you uh, actually, Anne, you said that the cutting together apart thing was was quite complicated. Is I thought it was well, I'm not a physicist. Yeah. <laughs> <And> <laughs> I found I found it uh, enlightening. Uh, but difficult to grasp. But people who've read more than I have probably just say, oh, yes, of course, and move on. So, so uh, if um, nobody else feels that it's complicated, I'm happy to move on. I no, I think it is complicated for, for all of us. And, and I think this is why we stay with Barad and we are, we are reading Meeting <laughs> the Universe Halfway um, for the second time. In the read in the Monday seven a.m. to eight a.m. reading group, because it's 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 very rich but also very challenging. And as non-physicists, to get the benefit of um, the the way that Barad diffracts the science, the narratives, the humanities, um, you know, it 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 does require some. Um, tenacity, if I can say that. Yes. What particularly spoke to me was the uh, piece about light and dark, that light yeah. and dark are not separate and distinctly bounded entities, but through diffraction, carry traces of each other within their formation. Hillary will remember that a couple of weeks ago, I was talking about the Chinese concept of yin and yang. And the, uh, the symbol of yin and yang, which is ha has the has uh, yin with a little yang inside it and yang with a little yin inside it. And uh, also this, uh, um, the, the concept of a balance between the two, there's no light without darkness, there's no day without night, there's no good without evil. This whole concept of the, of the, uh, um, the interaction actually between uh, supposed opposites that are not really opposites and the, and the unity of of all the parts of the universe i suppose is, is also absolutely you, you have to have it all otherwise you've got nothing <laughs> yeah yeah in, so in, that that spoke to me particularly this light and dark yeah and but she's talking in terms of uh, diffraction and uh, i was thinking in terms of interaction so i would like uh, an explanation of diffraction from somebody who understands it better than I do. In, in meeting the universe halfway, I think the example she gives is a razor blade. The, the um, light shone on a razor blade so that it, it um, casts a shadow. And, okay. in the, and in the shadow, there are striations. Mm -hmm. of light and dark and that's that's the example she gives and it's because of the the way that the light is not is not actually just traveling in straight lines and um you know keeping completely separate as it as it 
as it goes past the the edge of the of the object it actually yes. um, curves because it, it it's got wave like behavior um it's a little like looking at a straw in a glass of water. It looks as if it's bending. Oh, like that, yeah, refraction. I think refraction, refraction is a similar, and similar effect. Yes. It's a similar effect, effect. And I just wonder, uh, refraction and diffraction, they're two sides of the same coin. They're completely different effects. What yeah. are they? <laughs> um, just thinking what you can see. Can you see the shadow? Yes, I can. Oh, beautiful shed. I'd love to draw it. Have you <laughs> seen how that under certain conditions you get perfect circles in the shadows? Yes. And yes. That's, that's that's an example of um uh refraction. I think it's diffraction actually, and it's a it's a it's a question that um has come up for people over centuries about why this happens. Yes, and it's to do with the focal 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 length, so that it's it, the way that li the the light travels and diffracts, you know, uh, at certain um, distances. So, so for example, um, when you when there's a um, a lunar eclipse, you can sometimes get the shape of the moon mm -hmm. on the wall, and um, so, so there are examples of refraction and diffraction throughout um, nature, throughout you know the way that. It, it, so, so the the idea that you know to actually define light as as identifiable particles, you know, with with identifiable um, positions in space and time, are kind of. Mm -hmm. disrupted by by all these examples um does anybody else have a way of uh explaining more about um about diffraction in terms of this um these examples i'm really interested to see how we use it because how it works in physics is one thing, but how does it work for philosophy and for educational philosophy and for human interaction? Yeah, Why do so, we need it? <laughs> and I think Why do we need I'm to understand very, it? Yeah, you, you, if you read um, uh, Haraway and Barad, so they, mm. they do really interesting things with the concept of reflection. Mm -hmm. in, in education that's been historically quite central in terms of um you know knowing ourselves as learners okay so this thing of, of reflecting on our own thoughts or mm -hmm. uh, yes um and and early on in about in in the, um 72 i think haraway starts talking about the fact that the metaphor of reflection is not that helpful because it suggests that you're going, you you're looking for similarity, you're looking for authenticity or a direct uh, resemblance between what you're remembering. Or um, so she kind of starts talking about a metaphor of diffraction. Because when we reflect on our thoughts, time has moved on. We are a different person at that next stage. It's not a reflection. In fact, it's a complex diffraction of difference. And then Barad comes and 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 actually brings. Sorry, it's pouring with rain here now. Um, yeah. uh, brings yeah. uh, physics, uh, physics to bear on this educational dilemma, if you like. Um, so, so she she actually practices diffraction mm -hmm. as a methodology, diffracting uh, physics through queer theory. Um, she uh, diffracts different texts through one another, and it's about looking for not for the differences, but the differences that the differences make. 
when they meet mm -hmm. and change one another, much like those waves. Um, yeah, I just recently um, read a paper that Vivian wrote actually on slow scholarship and what some she she lists ten of um, the uh, methods. I don't know if you can call them methods. Ten of the criteria that you would work through um, to uh, practice slow scholarship, and one of them is diffraction. Mm. Um, so she talks I, I quite I really like what she wrote there as well as what you've written it's, it's been so good um, going through this new book that's just been I think it's only going to be launched in the coming weeks but um, she, the the third the third criteria for slow scholarship listed in Vivian's paper is diffract rather than reflect mm -hmm. thinking thinking together affirmatively so I really liked because when I think about reflection and I've worked with a few of the Center for Creative Education students as well. And what was great was learning with them. Teresa was part of this process as well. Um, and we asked them questions around reflection versus diffraction and, and introduced the concept of diffraction to them. And we were working on we were working with water. So reflection is, you know, if you were to look at the reflection often it reflects almost exactly the same image back to you. And, and uh, whereas diffraction is the interference. So not exactly the same as what's coming back to you, but where the waves make these patterns and there's a bit of a disturbance. And it's not um, the reflection only, but it's the reflection and. Yes. Does that make sense? <laughs> yeah, great, yes. Yeah, I also, I like the link between the, the slow scholarship and the diffractive methodologies. It's like paying attention to what is there, what's not there, the, 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 the new, um, the, the, the interferences, the disruptions, the, um, and, and not, and, and the, I think that one of the key things is that with with diffraction, um, it's it's trying to move away from a representational notion of knowing. Mm -hmm. So rather, we want to see where we are inside this diffractive reality, and and it's relational. So we're interested in, as you say, thinking with. So thinking with other humans thinking with the environment, thinking with the texts, thinking with, so, so it's very much trying to move away from interpretation and rather towards an active um, making a difference, an active engagement with the world and noticing the differences that that, that methodology can make. Mm. Yeah, she she writes here in a paper. I'm just quoting from from Verve. Um, she talks about it is it is different from comparing and contrasting this or that, and rather presents a way of thinking insights together, mm. which is from a few other papers. Yeah, okay. so I yeah. yeah yeah. I think okay. the more I read about the about diffraction, the more it makes sense. Mm. <laughs> so like, yeah. Yeah. So I don't, I'm not sure if my 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 internet is stable now. Is it stable? No. You 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 uh -oh. but, uh, yeah. yeah. Put it in the chat. Yeah, maybe right. Yes, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. So so Teresa, what I want yes, to say is. Hillary. <laughs> I think it's got enormous pedagogical consequences because what, what we normally do in classrooms is we give students two articles and then we ask them to say which one they think has got the better argument or mm. which one speaks to them more. and um, Or in critical literacy, we try to read, you read with and you read against a text. So yes. this is not about reading against a text mm. for critique. It's not only anti-representational, no. it's also trying to um, change critique. Yes. In other words, 
if you have a generous reading of two articles, yeah. then it's how, does, how do the differences between the two, how suggest other things to you? In other words, using difference as a, using diversity as a kind of productive resource. Yes. Rather than rather than to make judgments about one in relation to the other. Fantastic. Yeah. Thanks. That's a really important point. So it's going against the binary, Hillary, is what you're saying. Is that you mean one's good and one's bad? That yeah. kind of binary. Yeah. yeah. I think it does work yeah. against the binary, but it's also about but also the critique against uh, negative critique, rather going for creative. Generous, look, look, um, yeah, looking to see what, what the what light they throw on each other. Yes, yeah. You know how it's it's not about, and it's also like not about saying uh, a critical reading is all wrong. You know, here's a critical reading, here's a sympathetic reading. Uh, let's read them through each other and see how they affect each other. Actually, it's about looking at the looking at the effects mm -hmm. when you put the two together. And and it seems like and including how it affects you and what what else it brings up for you, which yes. which avoids the sort of fallacy of thinking that you're finding some objective truth outside. Of yes. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. So the and ethic that, of including. The affective and the mm. yeah. Mm. Thanks. Should we read on? We, sh we yeah. should read on, or we should go to the other paper. Yeah. Okay. We, should we dip into? We are reading two papers. Yeah, I to. think. Yeah, <laughs> and it's twenty to five, so it would be good. I think. Let's zip over. Does this a session end at five or half past five? Uh, George, I think five. Okay. The George finishes at about half. Hi, five. sorry, I just had to get someone by the gate. What time do we finish here? Um, it is scheduled until five thirty, but oh, I think. We, oh, good. Yeah, okay. I think if if okay. we if we end earlier than that, that's completely fine. No, no, no. We we were worried that we're going to run out of time. Oh, okay. no, I think we're gonna, we're gonna, gonna we are going to pop over to Roseanne's paper. Great. Okay. So I hope that the beginning of my paper has uh, maybe whet your appetite to read the rest of it before the launch, which is on the 25th of February, if I'm not wrong. Okay. Yes, that's right. Okay. Um, does somebody want to start? I don't. I, I would quite like to start. Can I start and then and then we have others? Okay. So chapter red, remembering as a sacred practice. Roseanne Reynolds, remembering memory is not merely a subjective capacity of the human mind, rather, human and mind are part of the land time scape, space time mattering of the world. Memory is written into the worlding of the world in its specificity, the ineliminable trace of the sedimenting historicity of its iterative reconfiguring. Barad 2017. In this chapter, I think and write with Barad who urges us to recognize that memory is not a record of a fixed past that can ever be fully or simply erased, written over or recovered. The memories I share in this writing are not mine. They are not held in my individual head or body and now shared by my hands through the keys of the keyboard I'm typing on. Rather, these memories are the enfolded articulations of the universe in its mattering and include my personal memories. These memories will be different. They are alive, continuous enactments of a changing universe. I am not turning back to look at these memories and they are not dropping into this present. They are already here, but gone. 
already past but different. Can somebody read? I can continue if you wish. Thank you. I grew up in apartheid South Africa. I endured apartheid education and compulsory schooling as a child and teenager, matriculating in 1993. Matriculating is completing high school. The year before Nelson Rolihala Mandela was elected as our first black president after years of colonial and then apartheid rule. I became a teacher in the same system on the same colonized land, divided, carved up and scarred by apartheid policies and practices. This is not a story or a sanitized history, but a painful remembering of life as a child of apartheid and a teacher growing out through and beyond that system in post-apartheid South Africa. In this chapter, I enact a remembering as a sacred practice because I will not be going back in time, but will embody a material reconfiguring of the life I lived as a child and adult in South Africa. The work of this chapter will also be to trace the entanglements of the delicate complexity of my childhood that is not past or gone, and my adulthood that is not fixed or stable. The autobiographical impossibilities of the entanglements of my childhood, me as a child, growing up in apartheid South Africa, and my teaching experiences are diffracted through as a remembering that emerged throughout this chapter. Shall I continue? Yeah. This, this remembering is made possible because in June 2017, while engaging in my doctoral studies full time, I had the radical and life altering pleasure of meeting Karen Barad. This meeting took place at a seminar in Cape Town, South Africa, hosted by the Decolonizing Early Childhood Discourses Project, funded by the National Research Foundation Project. In preparation for the seminar, our postgraduate critical post-human weekly reading group based at the University of Cape Town, began to read Karen Barad's inspiring and groundbreaking book, Meeting the Universe Halfway, Quantum Physics and the Entanglement of Matter and Meaning of 2007. This text would become significant in ways I would not yet come to know in 2017. In our reading group, we also read a pre-published version of Troubling Times, Ecologies of uh, uh, Troubling Times, Ecologies of Nothingness, Returning, Remembering, and Facing the Incalculable of 2017, generously shared with the group by Karen Barad early in 2017, ahead of the seminar. This article profoundly shaped my entire PhD thesis, and especially the first chapter of my thesis on which this chapter is based. Barad's article is a powerfully, generously diffracted reading through the 2005 novella From Trinity to Trinity by Kyoko Hayashi, translated from Japanese to English by Ayoko Otake. I bought the paperback from Trinity to Trinity shortly after the seminar. I was and remain struck by the image the book created in my body mind of the empty desks of the children who were incinerated when the atomic bomb exploded over their lives and school in Nagasaki, Japan in 1945. Then she starts with the travel hopping, which is what you do as well, Teresa. Travel hopping. Barat describes the travel hopping that Kiyoka Hiyashi painfully engages in as the embodied material labor of cutting through undoing colonialist thinking in an attempt to come to terms with the unfathomable violences of colonialism in their specific material entanglements. I use travel hopping or temporal diffraction as a methodology in this chapter. To understand travel hopping, it is important to understand temporal diffraction 
as developed through Barad's diffractively reading of queer theory through quantum field theory, QFT. QFT troubles time as previously understood through Western metaphysics. Temporal diffraction is based on the empirical finding that a given particle can be in a state of indeterminately coexisting at multiple times. For example, coexisting in the past, present and future. The implications for this chapter are that it requires us to think about time and therefore childhood very differently as we would need to think of temporal diffraction as an ontological indeterminacy of time. I will use the method of trouble hopping as opposed to a linear account of my schooling and apartheid education, including post 1994, to trace the entanglements and differences. Continue. The title of this chapter, Remembering as a Sacred Practice, comes from a quote in Troubling Times, Ecologies of Nothingness, Returning, Remembering, and Facing the Incalculable, and weighs deeply on my thinking body, especially, especially as I was privileged to hear, see, feel, and be affected by the paper as it was performed at a seminar at Monkey Valley. I have found thinking about remembering as remembering a powerful way to attend to entanglements of colonialism, racism, and militarism, which emerges through the retelling of different parts of various stories of growing up in South Africa. As understood through temporal diffraction, the sacred practice encompasses multiple iterations of sacredness as temporalities are specifically tangled and threaded through one another. In their Troubling Times paper for short, Barad enacts a diffracted reading of Kyoko Hayashi's novella from Trinity to Trinity. This diffracted reading is returned to by Barad at the seminar in 2017. The author, Kyoko Hayashi, remembers being a 14-year-old child when the atomic bomb was dropped on Nagasaki on 9th August, 1945. It was dropped close to her school, but as she was working at the steel factory, all her classmates were required to take shifts at the steel factory to support the war effort. She did not die. The novella from Trinity to Trinity is her account of remembering the bomb destroying Nagasaki. Hayashi recalls the devastation of the aftermath of the bomb. 52 of her classmates died. She remembers the empty desks at the school, which served as reminders of the children who sat in them. She writes of the grief of the Hibakusha, the survivors of the atomic bombs, and the name they are given in Japanese. Many children died in their teachers' arms. Teachers needed to bury their pupils as their parents had died, and there was no one left to bury them. Hayashi moves between Nagasaki as one Trinity site to the other Trinity site in Santa Fe, New Mexico, hence the novella's title. The tr Trinity site in Santa Fe, New Mexico is the site of the first atomic bomb tested in the United States soil. Barad explains that diffraction as a methodology is a matter of reading insights through rather than against each other to make evident the always already entanglement of specific ideas in their materiality. I too move between myself as a teacher and as a child of the war that was apartheid. I also move as a doctoral researcher through and, and with writing about chairs, desks, and the seminar at Monkey Valley. After our presentation, using a DVD entitled Shadow Stories, Poetics of an Encounter Between Science and Narration, which shows how Reggio Emilia-inspired teaching can be diffracted through Barad's theory of agential realism. Karen Barad is moved and says, my cells are jumping with joy. This is how to teach science. This is and is not the same science that created the atomic bomb which was dropped over Nagasaki, leaving empty desks in classrooms and bodies vaporized. 
We do not go back in time to the 9th of August, 1945 at 11.02 a.m. when the bomb exploded and then further back to the site of the first atomic bomb test in Santa Fe on the 16th of July, 1945 at 05.29 a.m. We are always in 1945, 2022, 2017, 1945. According to Barad, the travel hopping used by Kyoko Hayashi shows that what is at stake is not setting time aright, as if that were possible, but rather the undoing of time, of universal time, of the notion that moments exist one at a time, everywhere the same, and replace one another in succession. Wonderful, That's thank you. Amazingly powerful, this chapter. Beautiful, yeah. Incredible, wow. Sure. Uh, and I love how we're reading um, both of them diffracting. Mm. <laughs> you know, that's, that's practicing the diffraction. Yeah. Is it possible to read a, to receive a copy of the of that article, Troubling Times? Um, I think so. It's now published. When we when um, Bar when Karen Barad shared it with us, um, she hadn't yet published it. Mm -hmm. um, but George. Isn't there, a, is the, is the video, it's not available to, to the, the collective, is it? The video of, of Karen presenting that paper. Perhaps you can find out, George. I'll see. I'll okay, I will, I will do it. Yeah, uh, because and it is. It's really fantastic. There's a there's there is a video of Karen Barad presenting that paper, um, but we just have to check that it, that we have permission to share that. Otherwise, okay. we will get you the the published uh, the PDF. Yeah. 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 Okay. Great. Oh, <laughs> Teresa just yeah. said that <clears throat> some time ago Karen Morris yes. was going to ask Karen Barad. Mm -hmm. For permission to 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 make available to the group yeah. all the sessions from that seminar. Mm. Thank you. So, if okay. George could follow up on all follow of them, that, that would be. Yeah. Well done. Thanks. I also see Tandiwe sent um, a PDF on the on the chat. A oh, great of troubling time. Oh, there you go, Anne. Okay, how do I how do I download something from the chat? I've never succeeded in working that. Out. There's a blue arrow. I think it should work. If you um, open the chat, I've opened the chat. You see and there's a, the article. It says download. Yeah, there you go. Download. Click to oh, download. Here it is. Now Thanks, it's downloaded. Is how do I save that? Now they're little dots in the corner. They usually open it with another app. So I can maybe send it on the WhatsApp group for you later. Okay, perfect. That, mine, that, mine, that's always the best for me. I'm very lazy about learning. Mine about just the computer. mine <laughs> mine immediately opens my files, so I can save it as when I when I click download, it then go. It wants to put it in a doc in a in one of my folders. Oh, okay, fine. Mm -hmm. It's just uh, putting itself into my books folder now. Uh, okay. So uh, I've even learned how to do something new. How wonderful. Oh, there you go. <laughs> yeah, so, so, uh, what, so the, the thing about the travel hopping is this enfolding of time. Um, you know, the multiple dates that are not, yes. not can't actually be separated. Um, and she's uh, uh, the the um, the shadow stories that she's that uh, Roseanne is referring to is actually a video from Reggio Emilia, and it's about a group of children exploring shadows with their teacher. It's a lovely uh, video about um, science learning, um, and and 
So a group of us presented it at the seminar that Karen Barad was at. Um, okay, so now she goes into her number lines. I'm thinking, can we go back to Red Ochre for a little bit? What do you think? Oh, well, I think, I think it's yeah. interesting to see what you have to say about the same book. About the, about the travel hopping, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, here we go. Considering nuclear physics. Does somebody want to read? I'll take I'll take it up, uh, Teresa. Thanks, Molly. Okay, so considering nuclear physics and its agency, Brad writes not only about the behavior of atoms, but also about the survivors of the atomic bomb blasts in Japan. In particular, Kyoko Hayashi, who lived through the bombing of Nagasaki as a 14-year-old and wrote an award-winning novella from Trinity to Trinity, which Barad reads with quantum field theory. The protagonist in Hayashi's story is a survivor of the 1945 blast. The character visits the de desert in New Mexico where the bomb was made, enacting a work of mourning as a political embodied act. The physics of the bomb building are materially and ethically entangled with the affected lives and cells of human and non-human, plant, animal and other bodies radiated in the blast, all of which Hayashi's character traces through her space-time wanderings. She moves between the horror of the blast, her childhood school days, the bleeding gums of her, uh, of her later years, and her son's inheritance of radioactive DNA. Travel hopping is Hayashi's <clears throat> term, which Barad notes, sets up wonderful resonances and dis dissonances with the overused and much used term, under, sorry, much understood term, quantum leaping. Barad's yeah, but That's a typo, sorry. It should read misunderstood. <laughs> I think you can see that. Yeah, 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 yeah. okay, yeah. yeah. Misunderstood term, very good. I see, that was just to see if I was still awake. Barad's diffractive methodology enacted through various pieces of writing takes her on multi-directional science, art, performative quests. The queer performance of atoms and electrons is diffracted with queer politics, literature and the reverberance of wartime explosions and the ongoing possibilities for total destruction. Reading tales of these more than human interaction phenomena of destruction, devastation, neglect and waste, human and animal flourishing, draw my attention and empathy. My sense of the hauntology of the Johannesburg Park is through stories of human-centred migratory shifts triggered by the colonial city and the industrial mining machine that feeds it. Attuning myself to both time and material as inseparable aspects of city space, the park and school initiate a post-anthropocentric um, returning. Will I hold on there, Teresa? Can't hear you. That's a little returning for us to this concept of travel hopping. Um, I think we should read on, unless somebody's got some burning, burning comment. Okay. Someone else? So, so why is it called travel hopping, not time hopping? Mm, I wonder. That's Kiyoku, Kiyoki Hayashi has called it travel hopping. Because she um, went to two different places. Yeah, well, she went... Yeah, Nagasaki she went, and Santa Fe, is her, yeah. her uh, yeah. protagonist. So she traveled. Yeah. She didn't travel in time, Maybe, she traveled in yeah. place. Yeah, maybe she's making a play on time travel. Hill? I don't know. I don't know. I mean, um, like like Reynolds is traveling to same places, not the same, through time, uh, as opposed to going from one place to another through time. Mm, mm. And through time. I mean, hers is more... Space time hopping and time hopping. Yes. yes. It's just interesting. 
Mm. What do you think well, you would do? Teresa, you get, what do you think sorry? you would do? What do you think you were doing? Time hopping, travel hopping, um, time hopping. So so what's I think what's a bit different with my one and um no, it's the same, similar to Roseanne. It, it's also that macro micro thing, isn't it? You know, apart from the the times folded, the spaces connected across distance there's also um the the concern with a small reality of a preschool and its inseparability from bigger political and historical realities so i think maybe that's you know time space mattering and issues of scale. Yeah. That's a nice Anya, can I get you to read? I'm happy to read. Thank you. Uh, let me just, okay, there we go. Hauntings and Unfinished Stories. Awaking on Friday morning, June 20, 1913, the South African native found himself not actually a slave, but a pere, pariah. Pariah, sorry, in the land of his birth. The 1913 Natives Land Act designated 7% and later 13% of the country as reserves for the entire Black population, a diabolical vision never fully achieved. It intended to erase the histories and presences of indigenous peoples from the designated white landscape. The law's enactment effectively pushed black farmers off their land and the land they may have been leasing as tenant farmers and into employment. Land seizures and forced removals continued and further leg legislation was introduced to control movement and access. A few examples being the refinement of the Land Act in 1936, the Natives Urban Areas Act in 1923, the Group Areas Act in 1950, and the Separate Amenities Act of 1953. Black people were required to carry passes that permitted them to work and therefore be in white areas. Colonial and apartheid legal systems depended on the mechanisms of classification. Racial status assigned through various measurements and tests allowed different levels of access and privilege. These tests were notorious for dividing families with skin color or hair texture placed them or hair texture and placed them differently, a white or colored or Indian or Bantu slash African. These racialized divisions cut through uh, every aspect of life and innumerable laws, bylaws, and rules were enforced to separate races and in particular, keep white people apart from the rest. This was to suppress any opposition in this regime and most importantly, to support and expand the economic interests of the white alliance of state and capital. Black bodies would ideally be invisible or preferably absent, except in their capacity to, to serve these economic interests. At the demise of the Soviet Union and the fall of the Berlin Wall in 1989, Francis Fukuyama declared the end of history and the triumph of the ideal of Western liberal democracy. French philosopher Derrida responded by naming 10 plaques of global capital, pointing out that never before it's absolute, in absolute figures have so many men, women and children been subjugated, starved or exterminated on the earth. The plagues include new forms of under and un unemployment, migration and de deportation, organized crime, the arms trade and the increase in nuclear weapons. The untruth of the claim of the ideal expounded by Fukuyama haunts its naming. In a conference named Wither Marxism in April 19th, 93, Derrida dedicated his pre presentation to Chris Hani, 
the South African communists assassinated earlier that same month. Derrida follows the concept of the specter mentioned by Marx and Engels in the Communist Manifesto, Manifesto of 1848 to produce a hauntology, a play on the word ontology that disrupts the linear concepts of history and progress. For justice to exist as a concept, there must be an interdeterminacy and unfinishedness about the events. To haunt does not mean to be present, and it is necessary to introduce haunting into the very construction of a concept, of every concept beginning with the concepts of being and time. That is what we would be calling here a hauntology. Thanks. So the um, in in the Communist Manifesto, that's the line where they talk about there is a, there is a spectre haunting Europe. This this this, um, this haunting of of communism and and obviously the the haunting of the possibilities of this the the, the armies of of the unemployed, the and 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 the power of you know um, the majority. So so this this the specter, this ghost that is present, but in but but not. Um, uh, you know, Derrida is saying that that reality, reality or being. You've got to recognize the 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 ghosts, the 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 presences that are in the wings, or uh, um, I suppose thinking about in in a similar way the 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 yin and the yang, the 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 black and the white, the dark and the light, um, you know the 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 invisible that is present. Um, so so. So he he makes a play on words, ontology, which is being the concept of being. He turns into hauntology, and Barad takes this up, um, and 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 that's her her, um, her her discussion of the travel hopping. Um, she uses the word um, hauntology. I don't know if anybody's got uh, more to add in terms of that, um, the, 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 the hauntology as a concept. I think I noticed Nikki Romano also joined us. She's written about hauntology as far as I know. Hi, Nikki. Sorry, you didn't get a chance to introduce yourself, but oh dear. Is she here? I thought she dropped oh, off. She oh, she dropped off. Sorry. Pity. Yeah, I haven't read enough on ontology to um, say anything more. Teresa, I mean, yeah. you, see, you see it all the time, like in South Africa, mm. um, people, usually white people, kind of say, well, you know, apartheid finished 20 years ago why can't we just move on move on why are people so obsessed with the past you know all of that as the yeah, yeah. effects from the past don't exist in the present that's right and something as powerful that like as that is is reverberating continually um everything is 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 affected and shot through with that that history um, well, and not those injustices, I mean, those erasures, um, the whole notion of coloniality is built on the idea of how mind, body, minds have been affected. I'm, I'm completely. Um, I don't know what the word is. Horrified at how hard it is to to change systems that have been put in place. 
living areas, um, yeah. people's ability. Yeah. You know, a lot of those uh, systemic differences mm. that apartheid put into place are enduring. We still have separate schools. We still have yeah. separate living areas. We still have poor black communities um, in excess of any other kind of community, racialized community. Yeah. Yeah. So this notion that we should just move on, you know, yeah. is a is is completely exactly. contrary to the notion yeah. of quantum entanglement. Yeah. In fact, I quote Carl von Holt further on in this section here. Yeah. Um, I think if we're talking about read, read on, we, yeah. You talked about before about travel hopping and the micro and micro level, right? Yes. So I think when because when I read and wrote about ontology, I wrote about it in like as I said, transgenerational transmission of traumas inside yes. families. Right. And I think a lot of times it's very hard for us personally or in our family to see the I really like this quote the unfinishedness of events. Yes. In how much we're talking now about the, the bigger level and, uh, you know, society, but yeah. even if we look inside, you can see that the unfinishedness of events and yes. like the, home, the specters that walk in our yeah. homes and in yeah. our yeah. lives. Yes. Yeah, very powerful. Yeah. So, so um, Wood is a British, is an English uh, philosopher and art uh, theorist. So, when Derrida proposed the ten plagues, um, Wood um, added climate crisis as the eleventh plague. Very soon after Derrida made this um, this presentation. And Derrida agreed with Wood uh, that the 11th plague uh, should be added. And Wood notes that climate change is not just another addition to the list of plagues, but rather it is at the heart of the first 10. Still, the list is not complete. Woods adds a further plague, what he calls the animal holocaust, connected both to the first first 10 and to the environmental climate crisis. And I would note implicated in the increase in zoonotic diseases such as COVID-19. Hauntology does not only work with pasts, we are all also haunted by our possible futures. Some of these phantoms include superhumans and life on Mars. Many of these future ghosts are hopefully fading along with the belief in endless progress, economic growth and improvement. The impending calamities of rising temperatures and the extinction of increasing numbers of insects and animal species have changed things. And Wood says the future is not what it was. So Barad materializes the hauntology of Derrida to produce a creative returning of quantum physics and her time-space mattering with notice, notions of justice and responsibility. Quantum reality, the micro, does not follow a separate set of laws from the rest of reality, the macro, and therefore the queer behavior of electrons can tell us things about how, how time works with space and matter in the world. In Meeting the Universe Halfway, Barad suggests that the way that energy enlivens atoms cannot be accounted for by Newtonian, Newtonian space-time positioning. Niels Bohr's theory of the photon, the quantum of light, won him a Nobel Prize. According to the theory of physics, atoms, the smallest unit of matter, now visible with powerful electron microscopes, have a nucleus at their center and electrons charged with energy around them. Electrons are positioned at particular energy levels. They change energy levels, but are either at one, energy, one level of energy or at another. They are never in between. So this is 
um, something that Barad discusses, discusses in Meeting the Universe halfway. Um, if they ch if the, the electron changes to a lower energy state, they emit a photon of light. And the range of color of this light depends on the type of atom it is, you know, the the um, the, ke the chemical or the, the what's it called? The um, the type of metal or uh, you know on the on the um, periodic table, um, you'll get the particular color quality of light. Um, so as they change levels, so if they go to a lower level, they will emit a photon, and this is what um, Bohr did a lot of his his work on. Um, Newtonian notions of space and time urge us to measure the gradual loss of energy as the electron moves from a higher state of energy to a lower one. But this is confounded by reality because as proven by Bohr, they are never in between. Even more confusing is the fact that energy is constant before and after the electron changes position and therefore the question about when exactly the photon was emitted defies any logical answer. This is what is known as a quantum leap, although it seems there is no leap at all. So Barad had said that Kyoko Hayashi's term, travel hopping, had made a really kind of useful um, nod towards this concept of the quantum leap. So ghostly presences are our best explanations for nature's queer behavior and the infinite possibilities that haunt material presence. Newtonian confidence is unsettled by this theory of reality in which things are undefinable and indeterminate and declare themselves only in impermanent relationality. So not only is identity undermined, but also our familiar notion of time. We need to factor time in as a co-constituting aspect of phenomena. Colonial practices of erasure and the no notion of terra nullius, empty land, served the project of building empire. The notion of the void was a logical extension of Newton's classical physics and the ontoepistemology underlying it. For Newton, the identifiable presence and permanence of components of the universe were present within a ground of emptiness. Matter is discrete and finite, and the void is continuous and infinite. According to Barad, in quantum field theory, a vacuum is not empty and space is not a container for objects. Electrons appear and vanish, depending on the arrival or dissipation of energy. Life and death are always in close proximity. Can somebody wow. read? Or That's really amazing. Thank you, Teresa. <laughs> this is like incredible. And to have you read your own work. Thanks, Anya. It wasn't all just completely confusing. Sometimes one confuses oneself. But it is, it, I mean, Newtonian physics with everything definable, fixed, predictable would be so much uh, easier, I suppose, and more reassuring if if you were not open to change. But quantum field theory blows that all apart, and um, so how do one how does one make methodological use of these ideas. I think that's the thing, and that's what um, was it. Um, it was it was me. 
<laughs> I'm the one who always wants to make oh, something Anne, practical. And okay, it yeah, has yeah. To be, has to be useful. I mean, yeah. the theoretical is great fun, but how do I use oh. it? Mm -hmm. Why, how I is agree. diffraction a methodology? So let's read on because I think it, we're going to get there. Okay. Can I go? I attempt a tracking, tracing, and following right. into the tangled knottiness of pasts, presents, and futures, real and imagined spaces above and below ground, in wakefulness and sleep, clothed and unclothed. Attempting a travel hopping is not a self-centered stream of consciousness narrative presented as a pastiche or collage of reflective memory and impression that is unique to me as a particular situated individual. Nor is it a confessional through which I intend to reach a state of personal resolution and absolution. Importantly, it is an effort to recognize existing and ongoing relations of responsibility and accountability. A coming to terms with the unfathomable violences of colonialism in their specific material entanglements. Wow. Okay. Mapping traces and marks across bodies. We've got five minutes left, so I'll read the first paragraph okay. and then maybe we can just yes. you know, bring it together. Theorizing with physics and feminism, Barad brings issues of justice into knowledge making, moving back and forth between quantum physical accounts of wave behavior and the narratives of Gloria and Zeldua on trans queer consciousness, border zones between the United States and Mexico, and the novella by Kyoko Hayashi. Barad thinks with multiple stories, making cuts that, set, that reveal connections, specific, contingent, casual relations, causal. and causal, causal. causal relations and entanglements across time and space. I attempt something like this in my chapter, working with images and text and reading images with and against one another. Oh, just getting exciting. <laughs> no, oh, I <laughs> and, Should I read um, a little bit more or what? Sorry? Should I read a little bit more or do we have we don't no, have no. I do, uh, don't read any more. Um okay. because we could also, you know, read another sentence from from um Roseanne's, which also draw as beautiful images. Um we both work with images. Um so uh yeah please please go on reading and i'm sure we'll have the chance to talk more about the diffractive methodology so so just to whip through i've got images of the bums and a historical a drawing of a historical photograph of a prison and then a reenactment of that photo using my body and then um, sleeping children, sleeping children, and you'll see what we do with that. And then just to show you Roseanne's uh, images. Oopsie, wrong one. Um, uh, can you see, stop share, okay, share. I need to see red, here we go share right um roseanne's images are images of herself as a child at her house which her house witnessed some other histories that she diffracts with there's a face here of ashley creel um there's her with her siblings in the uniforms her text from her school um, exercise book, apartheid schooling. Yeah. So I'm sorry we don't have more time. Um, 
you know, Teresa, we would probably need another two hours. Teresa, yeah. can you ask yes. a question? How did the choosing of colors come about? For okay, Jess? so, yeah. Um, we each chose a color and have written about the color in the chapter. So it's it's almost like the color um, is is just another kind of um, part of the text, I would say. So so mine is red ochre, and and partly because of the connection of red ochre to um, burial. Um, uh, my my closing is very much about um living dying um uh roseanne's is red and um i'm trying to think where she writes about red um let's look for that Did you choose the colors before or after you wrote the chapters uh i think it was kind of during let me just see. We didn't read about red, hey, and we uh, yet. Okay, so we'll look for it. Uh, so but you, yeah, because we got up to there. Um, I just wanted to see if it pops up here. What color is sacred? There was a bit there. Yes. Oh, where's okay? Yeah. But yes. the best. It's maroon. Sorry, guys. I have to run, so I'm going to say okay. bye. As I return to read again, is what color is sacred? Bye, Anya. Bye, um, Anya. Thanks. Okay. Red ticks. Okay. Yeah. When I started writing this chapter, um, blah 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 blah. The knitted red jersey. I was asked by the editors to choose a color for my chapters. No hesitation, red. Many versions of red. My shoes, the ladder, the Peugeot my, behind me. Mm -hmm. Red ticks in my notebook, signifying authority of the teacher, told to mark in red by the apartheid state. Absence of red in the uniforms and I wear that I wear. What color is sacred? I'm struck that the word red is in the word sacred. As I return to red again and again in its different shapes and forms, it moves from color to included other in the remembering of the phenomenon of this child and childhood as a sacred practice. Thanks everybody. Hope to see you at the launch. Yeah, thanks everyone. And just a reminder that, so at this time um, next week and the following week, we'll be reading other chapters. And then on the 25th, which is a Saturday, we'll be having an in-person um, book launch where all of the authors will be able to talk about and um, their chapters and there will be discussion between everyone. Um, so it'd be great if everyone can sort of be there, but also follow the process of these returnings throughout the month. Um, and later today or probably tomorrow, I will post the next set of readings and the poster for next week. So you can look forward to that. And yeah. Thanks, George. Hopefully stay on the Thanks, journey. George. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, everyone. For being yeah. Thank you, everyone. Thank you everybody. Goodbye. Bye. 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 How do I stop recording? Let's go.